August 1916. Through gas attacks, mass artillery bombardments, and casualties into the millions, the Great War rages on. Despite some success in the East, the Germans find themselves no closer to victory on the Western Front. to the Kaiser on Christmas Day 1915, German Commander-in-Chief Erich von Falkenhayn argues that the key to winning the war is not on the Eastern Front against Russia, whom he believed would crumble and withdraw, but instead on the Western Front. If France could be defeated in a major battle, then Britain would likely seek terms with Germany. The string in France has reached breaking point. A mass breakthrough, which in any case is beyond our means, is unnecessary. Within our reach there are objectives for the retention of which the French general staff would be compelled to throw in every man they have. If they do so, the forces of France will bleed to death. February 21st, 7.15 AM, von Falkenhayn's siege of Verdun begins. For 21 hours, 1,400 artillery pieces rained down hellfire on the hapless Frenchmen. Despite initial successes, the fort of Verdun has still not fallen on July 1st, when a major diversionary offensive, the Battle of the Somme, is launched by the Allies. The move drains German manpower away from Verdun, a situation made worse when a further 15 divisions are sent east after a major attack by the Russians. German Chancellor Theobald von Bettmann-Holweg has seen enough. After a scathing damnation of the failure to take Verdun and the massive casualties suffered, von Falkenhayn is dismissed by the Kaiser. He is replaced by the hero of the Battle of Tannenberg, Field Marshal Paul von Hindenburg. A popular figure in an increasingly unpopular war, Hindenburg is joined by Erich von Ludendorff. Despite the changes in command, the battle for Verdun ends decisively in December, with the French emerging victorious. The Germans suffer over 200,000 fatal casualties. As the heads of the new high command of the army, Hindenburg and Ludendorff form a military-style dictatorship, intervening directly in government affairs at home. They advocate the resumption of unrestricted submarine warfare, a strategy directly at odds with that of the civilian government who fear this move may finally bring the Americans into the war. By this stage, an Allied naval blockade is taking an increasing toll on German food and materials. Hindenburg and Ludendorff push to extend the use of U-boat submarines to not only end the blockade, but to turn the tide of the war in their favor. The German naval leadership believes they can sink 600,000 tons of British shipping a month, a tally that would force Britain to collapse in five months or less. On February 1st, 1917, the Germans take the ultimate gamble and resume unrestricted submarine warfare. Allied and neutral ships are attacked without warning. Within two days, American President Woodrow Wilson severs diplomatic ties with Germany. On April 6th, after previously seeking to end the conflict without U.S. involvement, Wilson declares war on Germany. German High Command believes the Imperial Army can defeat the Allies in the West before the Americans can cross the seas to join the fight. They are wrong. If you are enjoying this video and would like to ensure that more episodes are produced, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment, and please consider subscribing to Enigma Productions.
Darkness over Deutschland continues now. After destroying 600,000 tons of British materials in both April and July, German naval warfare begins to falter and similar results are never achieved again. Improved naval escorts combined with an overstated British vulnerability condemned the U-boat war to failure. Experiencing no such downturn in fortunes, British naval blockades continue to take an increasingly heavier toll on German industry. As 1917 rolls into 1918, foods and materials become ever scarcer, and by the end of the year, an estimated 293,000 Germans will have perished from starvation and hypothermia. On land, the stalemate continues throughout 1917, with manpower and resources severely stretched. New offenses are currently out of the question. For now, the only option is to defend the land already held. After receiving reports of a proposed Allied offensive, the decision is made to retreat to a more easily defendable position, the Siegfried Stellung, or to the Allies, the Hindenburg Line. This move to a shorter front frees up an additional 20 divisions for the expected attack. The Germans do not have to wait long. On April 9th, the first offensive comes at Arras. Meant to weaken German defenses for a major French offensive to follow, no territorial gains are made by the Allies, yet they incur 150,000 casualties, the Germans suffering 100,000 of their own. The follow-up offensive at Chemie de fares no better for the Allies and is called off after five days. Another 130,000 Allied casualties are incurred with 29,000 mortally wounded. Undeterred by these ghastly setbacks, the Allies strike again in the summer of 1917, this time with an offensive near Ypres. Aiming to break through to Flanders and Belgium and eliminate the German U-boat bases there, the offensive never comes close to achieving its objective. Amid torrential summer deluges, the Allies become bogged down in the sticky Flemish mud, made worse by artillery bombardments that have churned the earth into a thick sludge. When the offensive is finally called off, British and Dominion forces had suffered staggering losses of 275,000 men, the Germans suffering 217,000. Despite a barrage of wartime propaganda, unrest in the population back home, as well as the army, begins to mount. Germany's ally in the Central Powers, Austria-Hungary, even makes overtures towards a peaceful surrender. But the German high command has no intention of giving up Belgium or any other occupied territory. For the Germans, victory, no matter the cost, is still the ultimate goal. As deep political cracks within a war-weary nation begin to form and cries for peace grow louder, the Army High Command look to the east, not the west, for new hope.